Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, thank you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, we're excited to have uh, Phil Washington and Keandra Tyler Dodds with us today. Uh, Phil is the CEO of LA Metro. Um, in his position as the Metro CEO, he manages an annual budget of $1.6 and is responsible for overseeing $15 billion in capital projects and providing oversight of an agency with 1.4 million boarding passengers on an average weekly day. Um, he's got a str strong background in transit, having come recently, or three, four years ago, from running the Denver RTD program, where they implemented fast tracks. And prior to that, he's been involved, um, it has many awards from APTA as a leader in the transit area. Um, he is uh, born and raised in Chicago, and um, was in the in the services for many years, and I'm just super excited to have Phil joining us today. Keandra Clear Dodds is the newly appointed executive officer for equity and race in the office of the chief executive officer at LA Metro. Um, she's most recently she worked as a manager of the preservation at the Los Angeles County Department Authority. She prior to that she prior to joining the LA CDA. Keandra was the Senior Program Director, Policy and Special Initiatives at Enterprise Community Partners. Um, and prior to that, she was a staff attorney at the Western Center of Law and Poverty in Los Angeles. So I want to welcome you today to this webinar and thank Phil and Keandra for being here. The topic for the webinar is, uh, the title for the webinar is LA's Equity Framework and the COVID-19 Crisis. Um, we will hear from, um, Phil and Keandra on how Metro is dealing with these issues and how they're leaders in the field. Thank you for joining us. Maybe I'll let uh, Phil or Keandra start. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And it's uh, great to be on this webinar. It's great to share with everyone kind of what we're doing around the equity program that we have established here at LA Metro. Uh, so thank you for inviting us, and I uh, want to make sure you all can hear me clearly. Um, I am joining you from uh, LA Metro's headquarters here in, in downtown uh, Los Angeles. Uh, this will be a joint presentation. Uh, I will begin with a high-level overview of LA Metro's equity program. Then my colleague, Keandra, will dig a little deeper into the execution of that program. Uh, Keandra is uh, LA Metro's Executive Officer of Equity and Race. Uh, this is a new position at Metro. Uh, I felt it was important to create this position uh, because uh, equity should be, must be, uh, at the forefront of the many, many investments uh, that we are providing here, if you will, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, I've always said that we should look at everything we do through the lens of equity, whether it be initiatives that we're working on, whether it be uh, large construction projects, whether it be fair programs, uh, whether it be uh, bus initiatives like we're doing with our next gen uh, bus program, we should be looking at all of these things and we should be looking at infrastructure itself through the lens of equity. Uh, and so that is why this position uh, was warranted and that is why we brought it on. Now, of course, um, you know, we hired uh, Keandra. Uh, Keandra is, and you just heard her introduction, very, very well qualified. I think she is the ideal person uh, to launch us uh, into this equity framework. Now, Keandra is in a different location uh, from me. She is in an undisclosed location, uh, <laughs> which is, I think, her house. Uh, but uh, I think you'll enjoy her presentation. Uh, but before that, let me start with a high-level review of our equity frame framework, uh, which I introduced uh, to uh, Revolution, at least the Board of Directors and the Board of Advisors uh, a few months back. 
Uh, our Metro Board approved this equity platform framework in 2018. And we have been advancing uh, this framework ever since then. Uh, that is part of Keandra's mission here at Metro. So let me talk big picture uh, here with a concise overview. Uh, access to opportunity is a core concept uh, to public decision-making, public investment, and public service. Uh, there is a vast disparity a vast disparity exists actually in LA County among neighborhoods and individuals. Uh, access to opportunity uh, for jobs, for housing, for education, health, and safety. And so we know that transportation is an essential uh, lever to enabling that access. Uh, I've often talked about uh, LA County. LA County is the largest county in America. It's the most populous county in America. And I believe it's the most diverse county in America. It's a county of 10 plus million people. Uh, and uh, the diversity that makes up Los Angeles County is phenomenal. Uh, the last time I looked, uh, over 50% of the residents uh, in LA County, the city of LA, I should say, were actually Latino. Uh, and so the, the uh, uh, diversity is pretty incredible. So as a transportation leader, we believe we being Metro can and should address many of the disparities uh, that exist. So the equity platform is built around four pillars, uh, define and measure, listen and learn, focus and deliver, train and grow. And I will talk briefly about each one of these. The first uh, define and measure, uh, equity holds uh, different perspectives and priorities uh, for many people. And we can go to the next slide uh, as well. Um, uh, equity uh, holds different perspectives uh, we need to establish uh, meaningful goals uh, around a shared, shared definition of equity. Uh, and then we need to take actions to achieve those goals. So the idea of defining metrics to evaluate outcomes, uh, including uh, this investment decisions is very important. And this whole idea of defining and measuring I think is very, very key. Uh, there's different uh, definitions for equity for a lot of people. And so hopefully we can talk about that or Keandra can talk about that. Um, I'm gonna just start by kind of reiterating why our focus on equity is so important rather than focusing on equality. So I imagine that most of you have seen this picture or something like it. Here, we think of transportation as the blue boxes. We provide all kinds of transportation for the region. However, that transportation is only as valuable as the destination access it provides and how well it provides it. To provide proper access, we have to make sure that we are meeting people where they are, both literally and figuratively. We need to understand the conditions under which the system is experienced and we must support their varying abilities to get from their different starting points uh, and their abilities to get to where they need to go, no matter their race, their income, or other identities or abilities. Now, let's say this picture represents the need for access to healthy food from, let's say, a grocery store. So the apple or the little red dot uh, is a store. Each person is at a different starting point and with, has different abilities to get to a grocery store. We directly control their mobility options and we have to make sure that we do that equitably so they all have a chance to get to a grocery store. Now this means some will need more blue boxes than others and that's equity. It's recognizing the different needs of our different members within our community. Now I do wanna note that systematic change would be lowering the tree or building more grocery stores. And while we don't control that aspect of development, we are exploring how we can influence systematic change. To further the point about uh, equity versus equality, I love to refer to a quote from an article called The Curb Cut Effect. 
And I'm sure many of you have read it, but if you haven't, I definitely recommend it. It's written by Angela Glover Blackwell uh, from PolicyLink. The quote goes, equality gives everyone the right to ride the bus. Equity ensures that the, there are curb cuts so people in wheelchairs can get to a bus stop and lifts so they can get on the bus and ensures that there are bus lines where people need them to go, sorry, where people need them so they can get to wherever they need to go. Equity means promoting just and fair inclusion throughout society and creating conditions in which everyone can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. So for us at, at Metro, an equity focus matters because it forces us to recognize, well, to look at our system and recognize that it wasn't created in a manner that supports access for all, from the quality to the location stops to various modes of transportation, we have some inequities. And so we know that historically, some of those inequities were created intentionally. Um, and there are many examples of this, including the, the freeway development, uh, which is a system that was often uh, developed in a manner that complemented racist housing policies and redlining maps. So for example, in the city of Los Angeles, the 10, uh, the first freeway that was built here was uh, developed right through the heart of a neighborhood called the Sugar Hill neighborhood, which was historically wealthy and all white, um, but it had recently seen uh, an influx of affluent black residents moving in over the years. Now the black residents were met with intense failed uh, legal campaigns to get them to move out, but and the city could have chosen an option to go around the neighborhood, but despite pleas from black residents, uh, the freeway was used as a tool to displace them amongst other things. Now today, we know that we develop with different intentions. However, we run the risk of exacerbating disparities in providing inequitable transportation benefits and burdens by not looking at the impact of our work on historically underserved communities on those existing disparities that still last today. So it's important to remember that opportunity doesn't trickle down, it cascades up. And I love this quote, which is also from the curb cut effect, because it reminds us that when we focus on those who are most underserved or those with the most vulnerabilities, sorry, who are most vulnerable, we end up helping everyone. And curb cuts are a really great example of that. Now, I wanna share, uh, what I've shared thus far really focuses on uh, equitable outcomes, but equity is both an outcome and a process, which leads me back to our four pillars that Phil started to introduce earlier. So at this point, I'm just gonna jump in to each pillar and talk a little bit about how we've been implementing our platform um, under each pillar. So first, the four pillars, of course, provide the framework for our approach to this work. And the very first thing that we've done under Define and Measure is to try and identify target communities, those with high needs based on various types of disparities, just like Phil mentioned earlier. Accordingly, we've created what we've called equity-focused communities. These are communities where at least 40% of the households are low income, earning $35,000 a year or less. And the household, the communities have households with at least 80% of them um, are households of color, or at least 10% of the households have zero cars. Now we developed this definition because through our research and engagement with stakeholders, perhaps not surprisingly, we identified race and income as the two greatest determinants of disparities within our region and really the country. And we added a focus on car ownership because we found that that can be an indicator for transit dependency. And so with this definition and identifying these target communities, we started to look at how do our, de our decisions impact them? What level of resources have we provided and are we currently providing to them? And what level of access to opportunity exists there for different for jobs, for housing, for education, and really letting that type of analysis help us prioritize our focus on those communities. The next thing that we focused on, and particularly since I've joined the agency, is developing a definition for equity. Phil, as Phil started to mention, um, you know, people wanna know what does Metro mean when they say equity? Uh, the question has come up frequently since we passed our platform, and I know that in different contexts um, related to transportation, people have different meanings. Sometimes they mean equality, sometimes it's geographic equity. That's a big uh, focus historically here in LA County. And this is why I've made it a priority to really develop a definition early on in my tenure. 
And so what you see on the screen is a draft definition that we recently presented to our Policy Advisory Council, Council which is a group of stakeholders, uh, including community-based organizations, uh, business representatives, local operators um, that also provide transportation in LA County, and local government representatives. As we move forward, we'll finalize this definition and use it to orient our work around equity. It'll be sort of the core to help us as we zoom in and try and focus on how do we actually implement the work in, other, in every aspect of what we do. Our next steps include determining how to better measure equitable outcomes over time to understand our impact. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the third pillar. The next pillar is the listen and learn pillar. And this really focuses on making sure that we're providing meaningful community engagement. This is the best way to make sure that we incorporate the values, needs, and priorities of the communities that we serve into our projects, our policies, and other decisions. This includes looking at our current engagement strategies, but also considering new processes. And one that I'm really excited about is our CBO engagement strategy. Now this came about because for the first time uh, ever, a few years ago, Metro hired a coalition of community groups to conduct community engagement for development of a first last mile plan for our oldest line, the blue line, or it's also known as the A line now. And while there were bumps along the way, the pilot was very, very successful. We built strong relationships with CBOs and the community. We hosted new innovative engagement efforts, different types of events uh, that brought out more people than uh, we had in the past and just new initiatives that we had never tried before and they were very successful. Ultimately, we built a strong plan that was not only supported by, but was co-developed with the community. One example of the community's impact was the fact that the plan's narrative includes uh, a redlining map and a summary of the history of racist housing policies in the area that led to disparities that are still faced today in the community. It was important for the community that the history be acknowledged and understood as a part of the backdrop for any future development, including our first last mile plan. So having that in the narrative and showing that we heard and respected the community and their perspective and concerns was a really important part of getting their support and their trust in working with us. And we're using what we've learned from that experience to determine how to replicate similar partnerships in the future. Um, and this, of course, will culminate in our CBO and great engagement strategy. When it comes to listen and learn, we're also, we have several advisory committees that focus on equity issues. And one in particular has an exclusive equity focus, and that's our equity committee, which is, uh, uh, includes members of the policy advisory group that I mentioned earlier. It's open to the public and has been instrumental in developing the platform itself and also our EFC definition. We'll continue to work with them in the future. However, we're also planning to create an equity advisory board. Now this board will help focus on different perspectives and voices that we don't have through other advisory groups. We'll be looking at different uh, equity experts, um, academics, philanthropists, and others that will really help us to implement this framework and strengthen our engagement processes and our processes in assessing equity more generally. Now, next, there's the focus on, there's the focus and deliver pillar. Now, under this pillar, we started developing several different pilot equity prioritization methodologies. And we've been directing our staff to explain how their projects support equity, to ask intentionally those questions and figure out a process for doing that. And now each uh, board report uh, that comes from our planning department in particular must include an equity platform summary. Now from, for some staff, that analysis has been more substantive than others. And the more substantive summaries use existing data, tools, and uh, maps to develop ways to identify communities most likely to benefit from the particular investments that they're working on. And they've used that to prioritize the particular projects or investments. Now, as we move forward, we plan to develop more uh, tools and processes, processes to consistently uh, determine and support the greatest need and support equity across all of Metro's departments. So it's a work in progress. And as I mentioned earlier, in addition to identifying target communities uh, with, with high need, we're looking to identify key performance metrics that help us understand and track our actual impact. Now this will be part of a broader process that supports equity 
And while we're still in the development phase, we know there are a couple of key components uh, that we must explore within that process. And so I wanna share with you a little bit about some of those key um, areas or issues that we wanna make sure we address. So first, we wanna make sure that we, we start at the end and we answer what problem are we trying to solve? What community need are we trying to provide for? And we really have to be clear about the outcomes we wanna see and what success looks like and be very clear about what equitable outcomes we wanna see. The next piece is really looking at data and it's looking at what the right data can tell us about the impact of community, can tell us about gaps and opportunities and disparities uh, that the project will address or proposes to address. It'll also help us to understand, um, or sorry, another part of that is just making sure we get the right relevant data to understand the project and the context of the community. And that's where engaging with the community really comes in because data can only take us this far, so far. We have to ground truth the data and work with the community to highlight concerns, needs, and other priorities that data doesn't provide for us. And so we wanna make sure that we're clear about how we identify the impacted community, make sure we're engaging with the right, um, the target population, and also make sure they have enough information to fully engage and have meaningful feedback and contribute to the project. We also wanna understand if there's any unintended impacts that we haven't considered by, in our initial discussions and, and work on this. The next part, is really we want to make sure we plan for equitable outcomes. We want to make sure that we're using the data, using the engagement, and we can uh, sh ship, sorry, and we can truly show how the plan is reflective of what we've learned and what we've gathered from the community. Uh, we want to also make sure that we talk about how we're reducing the opportunity gaps. What direct connection is there to equitable outcomes and how are we going to meet those and what are those outcomes? The next component is impl implementation. And we want to make sure that we regularly update the, and communicate with the community through implementation. We want to make sure we have a process for how we'll mitigate unanticipated impacts that may emerge during that process. And also, how will we measure what we did, how well we did it, and who we actually impacted? How many people did we serve? How many positive outcomes uh, did we meet? How many of our intended equitable outcomes did we meet and how can we uh, improve in the future? And that takes to the, me to the last key point, which is reporting back. We wanna make sure we report back to the community and our board and other departments because we have to work across silos. It's important to make sure that we're measuring success over time, that we're learning from each project and each process as we develop and uh, really expand our work on equity and be able to see the change and the impact that we make over time so that we can improve in the future. Now finally, there's the train and grow pillar. Now this focuses on Metro as an organization internally facing. This ensures that we embody the change that we want to see because to truly support equity, all of us have to be charged with advancing it. It's not just my job. Of course, I was hired to lead the work, but we wanna make sure that everyone understands why we're doing this work, what it means to do this work, and what's their role and their responsibility within to, to further this work. And so what we've done so far is we've had our first cohort that's participated in the, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity program. Uh, they participated for over a year. And then we also have had many uh, members of our senior leadership team participate in several trainings uh, from GARE. We'll continue to look at what we can do to introduce this work throughout the agency, from trainings to workshops to broader discussions. We have to work with our staffs to help them understand the importance and introduce it um, beyond the senior leadership team and the GARE cohort. So we're still uh, developing strategies to help us do that. Now, we've also looked at more broadly at our diversity and our efforts uh, to support inclusion and equity. We've made adjust adjustments to our hiring practices to try and address barriers of entry and also growth for underrepresented groups and all of our uh, employees. We want to make sure that our workforce not only reflects the region of LA County, but also our employees have a fair opportunity to grow and prosper in the agency. 
And as we move forward, I'll continue to work closely with our civil rights department and our talent development departments as we look to expand and improve our workforce development programs and improve our partnerships with our Metro's affinity groups and much more. This will of course take time, uh, culture change and change in the way that we work. But our hope is that once it's normalized and ingrained, it'll become part of our regular processes, our planning and our decision making. So where do we go from here? From here, we will continue to train and grow as an agency. We'll focus on both processes and outcomes. And importantly, we'll focus on the micro level and the macro level. It's important that we're not just focusing on project by project or decision by decision. It'll be really important to look at the high level, agency-wide, region-wide, to see what we can do, where are the key challenges and barriers and how do we address them, and how do we, what short-term goals must can we set for ourselves and what are the more long-term goals that need a little bit more time to figure out. And then we also focus on the now which I'd like to talk about the now for a little bit, because obviously we're here because we're in a crisis. We're dealing with COVID-19, one of the coronaviruses. That's the reason we're presenting virtually. These are really unprecedented times. And so accordingly, we thought it would be fitting to have a conversation about how we're considering equity in our response to COVID-19. So we're gonna switch over to the Q&A portion. That's just, it's kind of a Q&A between myself and Phil, and we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Phil, are you there? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. One of the things that we've been thinking about, and before we, we get to the questions that have been posed to me and to us as Metro, uh, let, let me just uh, uh, embellish on one thing that Keandra uh, briefed on, which was an uh, outstanding uh, uh, overview. Uh, and one is the key performance measures that are being developed. Uh, I think when we talk about determining uh, those equity key performance measures, that's going to be very, very important because at some point in time, there's going to be an equity score, I would think, uh, that comes out, uh, that is spit out after all of these things are uh, inputted uh, in terms of a project or an initiative. Uh, it won't be long before people ask, well, what is the equity score for that particular project? So I just want to mention that, and that's something that, uh, that we're working on, and Keandra is taking the lead on that. The other is determining how to evaluate project equity uh, on voter-approved projects. Uh, and because it sort of comes after the fact, if you will, uh, our equity platform came after uh, our uh, half cent measure M sales tax uh, referendum was passed with specific projects and timelines or schedules in it. And so that is something uh, that we are um, uh, really interested in figuring out how we approach that. But as Keandra said, uh, Metro, we've been asked many questions uh, about our response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, will we shut down the system? Will we provide free fares? Uh, you know, a service must go on is what we have said. Uh, our system is a lifeline for many, many people, a lifeline for those individuals that must take public transit and have no choice. Uh, transit dependent people uh, in need of essential resources or working as first responders. And so these are the kinds of questions that we've, uh, that we've had and these are the kinds of questions uh, to start with that uh, Keandra and I have been uh, sort of grappling with and so uh, I want Keandra to maybe talk a little bit about uh, those. I'll, I'll sort of chime in as well, but uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis and uh, free fares, let's say. Keandra, can you talk a little bit about that and how that works into equity? Yeah, so of course, you know, we've been asked 
will we provide free fares? This often comes up because on one hand, we know that um, there is a crisis and we've been encouraged to do social distancing. Um, and so many are encouraged to stay home and not ride transit or not navigate the city or the county at all. But there are many who have no choice but to work. There are first responders, they, um, you know, or they have to work to be able to make a living for their family. And some have asked us, will we provide free fares to support them? Um, and, you know, I think it's a, it's a tough question because on one hand, you know, we're facing significant ridership decreases. Um, on the other hand, we've had to shift to backdoor boarding. So it's really difficult to actually collect fares at all. Um, you know, this is a strong equity question because it's our, does providing free fares support equity at the same time? It has, it raises an important question of, you know, if we provide free fares, does that encourage some to ride who may not be taking this as serious um, as they should? So we've had to grapple with that. And our, our current point right now, like I said, we're doing the backdoor boarding. So we're not enforcing the fares uh, when people get on, but this is one of the really tough questions that I know many agencies have been asked. Yeah, that, that's good. And let me, let me just comment on uh, what we decided to do. Uh, and that is not, um, you know, say that we were a free and fair system. Uh, even though we have rear door boarding, we also messaged uh, that people that were entering the bus from the rear door, we did not expect them to use the fare box or the tap validator at the front of the bus. Uh, and so people will say, well, that's mixed messages. Uh, we stayed away from the, the term, the word free. Uh, and I got criticized for it, but I stand by it uh, because uh, we believe that uh, if you use the word free, uh, then you have unintended consequences. And this is what Keandra uh, was saying. I think it flies in the face of social distancing uh, when you say you're going to have a completely uh, free system. And so that was just our take on it. Uh, it's actually working. And I gave this example to an elected official uh, who called me yesterday and asked me about this. Uh, and my response to him was just what I just said, but it was also, I mean, uh, when you say free, people will actually run into a burning building for something free. Uh, and so uh, our thought was it flies in the face of uh, social distancing and it would bring people out uh, that just heard that the system was free. So that was the main reason we stayed away uh, from uh, providing a, a free service. The other big thing that I think is very, very um, uh, relevant to this issue is uh, how do we continue to safely provide service with low ridership uh, and operators facing their own personal challenges? Uh, there's telecommuting, uh, strengthening cleaning protocols. Uh, we talked uh, a little bit uh, on a call with our governor here in California uh, about how this may, we may be looking at the new normal. Uh, we may be actually uh, reinventing transit as we know it. The new normal being people are likely now to change their travel habits, um, telecommuting, uh, I think will take on a whole new meaning. Uh, and so what does that mean for equity? What does that mean for as we stand the system back up and recover after COVID-19? So all of these things, uh, you know, potential service reductions, uh, we lost between 70 and 80% of our ridership. We reduced service by 20, about 20, 25%. Uh, and so we were very, very careful thinking about equity. We were very, very careful to think about those transit dependent riders uh, looking not to, to be surgical in our reductions and not come at our reductions with some sort of meat cleaver, uh, 
but to look at those routes that uh, the uh, majority of the riders are low income and, and be surgical in those reductions. Uh, and so I think that we've done that, thinking about uh, equity. So I will stop there. I don't know if, Kendra, you wanted to add to those other two things that I mentioned, but uh, after you speak, we'll stop and do the Q&A. I just wanted to add, um, you raise a really great question about the new normal and what happens if more people start to telecommute. I think it's an interesting question for our agency, considering that, you know, the majority of our riders that ride it at least five times a day, um, they're actually low income. And so there's a question of how many of those jobs would actually be able to, if at all, telecommuting. So it's, you know, I think it will be interesting to see the actual impact that it has on our ridership. Um, and I think, you know, it's also, as we, as we look at bus versus rail, there's also sort of a difference there because I think 75% um, of our average uh, riders that ride at least five times a week, they're low income. So it may have a bigger impact on rail, um, but those will be things that we need to think about as we think about who we're providing service for and um, kind of the outcomes of what happens with our projects and how we best serve a community that becomes more transit dependent um, or that a community of folks that are more transit dependent than others, um, if that indeed does become our new num normal. And, and Dan, before we turn it over to you uh, to, I, I don't know if you're facilitating the Q&A or you want us to, but let me just say, that one thing that we have not talked about, and it, it's in a, 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 a very relevant issue uh, on our transit systems, especially the systems in the Western part of the United States, like ours, is the homelessness issue. Uh, the homelessness issue and whether and how uh, that relates to equity. Uh, this is a huge issue right now. I mean, we are, uh, during this COVID crisis, as we have said, and our elected officials have said, that really only essential people should be out, uh, the question then becomes, well, you know, do you assess the person that appears to be homeless and appears to simply be riding the system all day? How do you assess that individual from an equity standpoint and deem that individual non-essential. And so this becomes uh, some, you know, some very, very relevant questions. I uh, just had a conversation with our, with our chief of security. Uh, I mean, do we uh, assess uh, people uh, and try to determine whether they uh, are non-essential on our system and possibly homeless to protect those essential workers that are currently and still using our system? It's a very, very tough question. And, and I, I would also add uh, that as we look at, you know, uh, systems across the country, um, and especially in the warm climates, um, there are people uh, and we know that there are shelters that release uh, homeless individuals at 6 a.m. in the morning. And many of those shelters know that those people, and actually give those people tokens and fair media. Uh, I got to think, and I told my security chief that this this morning, I got to think that those uh, agencies know that they're going to ride the train all day. Uh, and so that puts the transit agency in a heck of a, uh, a situation, especially when you're talking about COVID-19, equity, and all of those things. So I just, uh, at the risk of being provocative, um, I wanted to put all of that on the table. I know it's a lot of stuff, and we probably got a lot of questions as well. Well, Phil, Phil and Keandra, thank you so much for the presentation and the discussion there. I am gonna facilitate some of the Q&A We've got some folks that have been uh, adding questions. And for those in the audience, please feel free to go to the Q&A button at the bottom and add your questions. You could also like them up. I'm going to start with two questions. Um, one is, what kind of resistance or challenge has there been in advancing the equity framework at LA Metro? 
I know that you don't just end up in a place where you're implementing equity without having to, to uh, get some guidance and support from stakeholders. So the question again is what kind of resistance or challenge has there been in advancing the equity framework at LA Metro? Well, let me, let me, let me start with that. Then I'll ask Keandra uh, to chime in. Um, you know, I, I don't know if we got resistance. Um, uh, you know, I, I would say that people uh, opined and people asked a lot of questions on how we would define equity. And so I, I don't know if it was resistance. Our board was very supportive. Um, the uh, various community groups were supportive. Uh, it was more of a question was, how do you define equity? It is probably uh, the toughest uh, part of the discussion, if you will, because as uh, Keandra uh, had one slide, you know, with the trees and, and, and the, uh, uh, the platforms, um, equity is different for a lot of different people. I mean, it, it, I heard a gentleman uh, say not too long ago, um, when, when you talk about equity and privilege and all of that, uh, privilege is when you're standing on third base, you know, uh, in life and you thought you hit a triple, <laughs> you know, you just ended up on third base almost at home uh, in, in, in terms of a baseball analogy. Uh, but to answer that, I don't think we got resistance. It was more of how you're gonna do this and define equity. And I'll ask Keandra to chime in on that. Yeah, I'll just uh, second that. We haven't really had much resistance, but I think the real um, test will be once we've defined equity and we have processes and we really start to make decisions that are prioritizing that high need in a, in a different way. And that might change some things around. That might change, you know, initial plans uh, that we may have developed or that uh, some jurisdictions may have had in mind for how we are uh, in making investments and different things like that. Um, so, you know, I've seen it in other parts of the county. Um, we, you know, we had a, a parks needs assessment that led to changes in the funding strategy for the county on parks um, uh, and open space. And they didn't receive pushback until the funding decisions were made. So I anticipate that it's really once we start using this framework to make decisions intentionally and um, kind of it becomes more part of the forefront, then I think we may experience some, some pushback or at least questions um, at that point. Thank you. I'm going to turn to another question um, that's kind of related, and that is um, given that Metro can only control a limited set of factors around encouraging equity, how do you propose to measure success? And early in your, early in your presentation, you talked about what you control and don't control um, and so this measurement thing is really important, I think, as we get into this topic. So love your response to that. Maybe Keandra, you could start with that one. Yeah, that's, so that's a tough question. Um, you know, we often get asked this question, especially in the context of housing, right? That's a, that's a primary example. Um, you know, people ask, you know, they recognize that depending on where you're developing the transit network, um, we have an impact on affordability sometimes on the location of different developments. So what is our role? How do we measure um, the impact that we're positively having on that? Um, I will say that while we're still developing and figuring that out, we are looking very uh, intentionally on our, our transit oriented communities policy. We're looking at, do we measure it by the different types of policies that we incentivize cities you know, to, to pass? We, if we make it an incentive if you have this type of development, we give you a priority for different competitive funding options or different uh, prioritization of projects. We're looking at um, kind of a variety of things that really help to identify actual change and impact, things that can make a difference. So we're trying to find that balance between looking at what we can control and measuring that direct change versus measuring the incentives and, and ways we we incentivize the broader community or the other jurisdictions or other projects um, to change to be more supportive. So, you know, we don't have a more specific answer at this point, um, but we are having those tough conversations and that's where we have to start. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to a slightly different tact on this and, um, and back to you, Phil, I think you've talked a bit about this 
but have you considered the impact of the new normal on the revenue generated from the sales taxes, as well as the types of services the transit industry will provide? And obviously there's a lot of transit agencies that depend on these sales taxes and the implications of that. So your thoughts on that would be great. Well, uh, you know, let me, let me just comment on uh, our losses in terms of sales tax. I mean, what we predict uh, so far. Uh, we predict between now and the fall uh, that we stand to lose about $800 million in sales tax revenue uh, going forward. And uh, I think when we start thinking about how we stand up our transit agencies around this country, uh, it's going to take time. And so I see this new stimulus that's coming as a one, it's, it's, uh, it fills the gap, but we're going to need more. And I'm not just talking about LA Metro, but I'm talking about transit agencies all over this country. Um, this, this new normal, I think, is going to be with us for a while. Um, I think uh, the private sector has done this for a long time, you know, in terms of telecommuting and, and those kinds of things. And I think uh, uh, more firms, more companies will do that. So the question will be, uh, if telecommuting and all these work from home things, or even travel patterns uh, change, which I think they will, uh, the question will be, um, you know, why are we spending all this money on office real estate? for example, if we are going to have people, if this is the new normal to work from home and all these things and Zoom and all of this, uh, what does that mean for the traditional office setting? What does that mean for transit? Uh, and I think the jury is still out. I mean, obviously we're, we're just beginning this COVID-19 crisis. Um, but uh, I think um, we have an opportunity uh, to have a say in how transit looks uh, in the future. Uh, and that has to be part of all of our recovery plans uh, going forward. So that's what I would offer up, uh, uh, that we think about this and maybe uh, Revolution has a play in this uh, to help redefine transit as it may be in the context of this new normal. Great points, thank you. I'm gonna combine two questions that I think kind of relate to each other. Uh, one is, what do you find the most powerful, what do you find is the most powerful or transformative aspects of the equity framework that you've developed and why? And then related to that, um, if an agency is, or a community is just getting started addressing this topic, what is, uh, what is the first thing that they should do? Yeah, yeah, I'll take the first one. I'll ask Keandra to take the second one maybe. Okay. Uh, I, I think the most powerful uh, in our framework uh, is, is probably two of the pillars. Uh, you know, it's, it's probably unfair that I'm saying two of them. You want me to pick one probably. Uh, but I think define and measure and focus and deliver. I mean, those two um, are uh, to me, the most powerful. The one, the first one, define and measure, uh, is almost a passive, right? I mean, it, it, it becomes sort of a passive thing that we may not get much, much pushback on. And this goes back to one of the points Keandra was making. But once you start talking about focus and deliver, uh, and that comes with probably expenditure of funds, or someone not getting what they thought they were going to get, uh, that becomes a very, very powerful thing. Uh, and it, it really becomes uh, an issue. Uh, and this, this whole idea of equity and leadership in this area, uh, a good friend of mine at uh, the Kennedy School, uh, Marty Linsky, uh, says it this way, and I think it's relevant to leadership in the equity uh, arena. He talks about uh, leadership as being the art uh, of disappointing people at a rate that they can absorb. Um, and when you start talking about equity, it sounds great 
until I lose something that I thought should be mine and it goes someone it goes to somebody that uh, that you know should have it in, in the context of equity that is when uh, you know, we will hear the, the naysayers scream out. And so I'll ask Keandra to answer the, the second part of that question. So that's a great question. Um, you know, I would say first, it's really important to set your framework and your values. What, it, what does it mean for you to engage in this work? Um, and just be really clear with that. You have to start there. I, I think our, you know, our platform, our four pillars, are really helpful in guiding and giving us um, kind of key areas to focus on and a, and a key way to go about it. I think it's also really important to make sure that there is the buy-in at the executive level and also the board level. I think, you know, to really make this work a part of, you know, interwoven throughout everything the agency does, you need that. You need that support and you need that buy-in to get everyone to, to really start to change their work. And how they're incorporating equity and so it's not just something on the side or something extra um, you have to make sure you have that support and then i also would say it's important to have a team that that leads this work um, you know depending on the organiza organization or the entity uh, this is a tough job there is a lot to focus on there you know there's the internal the external there's the projects at the micro level projects at the macro level there's the communications efforts around it and really building that, um, working with the community. There's a lot to it. And so I think it's important to have strong leadership, um, you know, someone who's both able to work within the agency to get the changes done that are necessary, but also someone who has relationships and understands the community because that's just as important as that internal piece. Okay, well, this is great. So um, I'm going to do one that's maybe a simpler answer. Um, with 800 million in lost tax revenue, how much in the fair? How much of this is in fair box? How much in fair box revenue, and what kind of reduction is, in service will be required? The question uh, about balance. The 700 to 800 million is sales tax. Uh, the fair revenue that we normally get on an annual basis is about $300 million. Uh, and so uh, the, 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 the figure that I cited of 800 million was just sales tax. So another 300 million or so that we've lost uh, on uh, fair box revenue. So you've got both of those. Um, the stimulus is out there. Uh, I mean, you know, this is why I've said that our losses will exceed anything that the government, uh, you know, uh, provides us from the figures that I've seen. Um, and so this is going to be a hard road back. And, uh, and you add that, uh, you know, you, you, you add the fact that people are not going to rush back to transit like the next day after this is over. I think it's going to take six, eight months for people to have a degree of confidence to come back to transit, even though uh, every agency I believe in the country has strengthened their cleaning protocols, did all of these kinds of things. Um, but I think, uh, and I was telling our security chief, uh, what, I, what I hope does not occur uh, is that there, uh, there appears some metric uh, that says we have to, you know, uh, socially distance, and there's going to be some sort of FTA metric that says you must socially distance, and there's going to be some social distance police, uh, you know, 12 months from now, you know, checking out, and that'll be looked at during the triannual or something. Um, you know, th this is going to be a long road back. So a couple more related to the COVID recovery, and I think you kind of actually were kind of answering that with this last answer, but uh, what do you think the recovery from the COVID-19 would look like and how would you get right back? This question, how would you entice them back? Uh, entice the riders back? Yeah, how do you get them back? Yeah. Well, well, I, I think a couple of things, and we've we're, we're actually been thinking about this and, and uh, I uh, am, you know, on the verge and putting a recovery plan together and having a recovery czar, if you will, uh, a 
young person in the, that maybe have come out of my leadership academy. I think it's a great project for them. Um, but I, I think there's going to have to be a number of things. I, I think one, we have to assume that uh, we will be coming out of some type of recession. Uh, and the question becomes, you know, after this is all over, people have lost jobs, people are going to be short of money, their savings is going to be dwindled. Uh, transit is going to have to do something to assist in the recovery. Now, you know, whether that is uh, deep discounts, whether that is free transit, uh, X number of days a month, uh, there's going to have to be uh, some sort of uh, uh, incentive uh, things that we put forward as transit to get people back. Uh, and I think that is going to be a huge part of it. Uh, the other huge part of it is things that we've been doing all along, right? Um, you know, when I look out my window and I see no congestion on LA freeways, that's incredible. Uh, and, and, and so we are going to have to try to convince people not to get back in their cars. So I think there's going to be a combination of incentives to come back to transit uh, and also incentives to not uh, drive your car, um, which we've been trying to do. It's going to be a combination of any number of things to get people back, uh, but it, it's going to have to be convincing them that our systems are clean and safe. Thank you. Um, last related question to COVID, and I guess it actually goes back to your statement earlier about the homelessness issue. Yes. People being released uh, from for the day and being on your system. Um, I know someone in Denver who you worked with before asked this question, um, that they're dealing with the same issue in Denver uh, with the shelters closing because of COVID-19 and people going on. Um, what? What solutions could you come up with to deal with that, if at any? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, during this crisis, during this crisis, I think, and we're exploring this, uh, is what I described earlier. Um, how do you assess essential travel? I mean, how do you assess that? Uh, we're struggling with that now. I mean, just today, uh, I was talking to uh, our security chief uh, about this. I mean, if someone uh, gets on one of our rail cars, this happens every day in Los Angeles, and uh, you know, and you know, they have three, you know, garbage bags. They are riding the system back and forth. Uh, they go uh, to the end of the line. They do a cross, uh, a walk across the platform, get on the other train, uh, go back uh, the other way. I mean. Uh, how do we assess essential travel? Right now in COVID-19, uh, our elected officials are saying only essential travel should be out. Uh, how do we determine that in order to actually protect the, the, the essential, the real essential uh, personnel that are actually riding the system now? And so we're experiencing, uh, we're experiencing uh, ways that we can do that uh, but it's not easy. Now, you know, we were told that, hey, listen, uh, if you're going to do that and kick people off the system, you have to make sure that you provide and make sure there's provisions for temporary beds over here. And I'm thinking, okay, we, you know, that's, we, we want to help people, uh, but, you know, uh, a selfish part of me says, why should I worry about that? I'm a transit agency, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, this is not an easy thing, but we're trying to get our feet in the door, right? Uh, uh, in this COVID crisis uh, to determine essential, non-essential uh, and look to make those assessments and say to that individual, hey, listen, with all empathy, uh, you're not an essential traveler, you're not going anywhere, uh, and this is for essential travel only. It's a sip, slippery slope. It's a slippery slope, and there's nothing easy about it, but I think that gets our foot in the door to address the overall normal uh, transit homelessness issue. 
Thank you. And now for my last question, but before I go there, I wanted to say thanks for your leadership on these issues. Also, as you know, we're struggling with this as, a, as an organization, Rail Revolution, trying to infuse equity in all that we do. So this, yes. your leadership, the leadership of the agency, everything you're doing is very helpful to us. And this session today has been extremely helpful. So I'm going to close out a question back on the equity topic. And are there examples of entities that are further along on the equity journey than you are at Metro that you've looked at for ideas? And are there any pitfalls or other things we need to look out for or any ways that we could get help from others that you've already sought help from on this topic? I guess we'll start with Keandra on that. Yeah. And I just, I just wanted to chime in um, briefly before I answer this question on the last question. Sure. Uh, you know, I think as Phil mentioned, the issue of homelessness, especially during the COVID-19 crisis, will be a real challenge to, to resolve. I think, you know, we want to just make sure as we're exploring how we resolve it, we be careful to make sure there's enforcement that's uh, equitable. I mean, we're, you know, at this point, if people are entering the buses from the back uh, door boarding and not, and we're not enforcing, um, you know, fares, or um, we want to make sure that we're not singling out and treating people differently um, through this process, because that can cause a real challenge. There may be some people that are, you know, trying to get to a shelter or trying to get to uh, the grocery store or, or who knows, but it's part of a bigger issue within the broader city that um, we're experiencing. And it may get worse, especially because as many people are out of jobs, evictions might start to increase and the homeless, uh, the number of homeless individuals might start to increase as well. So that's something that I think it's important to be just cognizant of. Um, and, you know, it's also a reason why it's so important to, to partner with the city and with the county, all the 88 cities, but, um, you know, those who are really focused on addressing homelessness, um, because they have that very challenge, you know, they can't remove people that live on sidewalks unless they have a place to house them um, under uh, different legal issues uh, that they're forced to address. So it's just really important that we look at those, those aspects of the work. Um, and then to answer the question, what other entities have already started to engage in this work and uh, what pitfalls are there that we should try and avoid? So there's several different agencies that have engaged in different ways on this work um, from Seattle, of course, in King, Kings County uh, to in the Bay Area, the MTC, um, also in the Midwest, St. Paul, Minnesota. So they've all engaged in different ways. Some have um, specific equity action plans uh, that are you know, countywide um, and their transportation agency is a part of that plan. Some it's specific to their transportation agency. Some have focused like uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, I know they've developed certain equity analysis tools to help them prioritize particular projects and um, develop kind of their own set of performance metrics to measure equity over time. I think, you know, we're working and trying to learn from all of them, but our challenges in, in Los Angeles are so unique. Um, for example, you, you'll notice in our equity focused communities definition, I'll try and be quick, but one of the requirements is that your community be at least 80% community of color. And that's because the majority of Los Angeles County is actually my, uh, uh, people of color, which is different from many parts of the country. So we have unique challenges and differences um, that require us to really develop our own action plan tools um, and analysis for the different data that we're using. So we're trying to, to learn from the different pitfalls on, on community engagement, um, data analysis, analysis etc. Um, but it's a lot to take in and we are um, you know, it's part of the process, but we're definitely moving forward and uh, hoping to make progress soon. Thank you. Bill, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, well, just one last thing. Um, and Keandra is exactly right uh, in terms of assessments, uh, which is why we talked about assessing everyone, not just, you know, the person that, is, that appears homeless. Uh, and so I think that is very important. Uh, and now you see why we hired a person like Keandra uh, to run our equity uh, platform. This is a very important work uh, and we're happy to have her and we're happy to share uh, what we're doing uh, with the rest of the country through revolution uh, and learn uh, what other folks are doing as well. So thank you for having us.
Thank you. Thank you both for the great conversation and Phil for being such a leader on our board and supporting our efforts to do this. So we're really uh, pleased to have you. Thank you.